All right, good morning. If you have your Bible, let's open it up to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, we did put some Bible journals out in the chairs uh, right in front of you. Uh, you can grab one of these. These are great, okay, uh, for a lot of reasons. If you don't like to necessarily mark in your Bible, these are great to mark in. They also give you a full page to be able to make notes. Uh, so really, really great things. So uh, grab one of these. This will be what I'm teaching from. Uh, it is the ESV. Uh, typically, we teach from the NIV, uh, but, but for this, we're going to be teaching from the ESV just because it's the version I ordered online. And, uh, and uh, in case you're wondering, what's the difference? Like, what's the difference between the ESV and the NIV and, and those kinds of things? Well, uh, the, the ESV is a word-for-word translation from Greek to English and the NIV is a phrase-by-phrase phrase translation from Greek to English. So it'll take kind of sections or chunks uh, where, where the ESV takes word for word. So, um, so anyway, it, I, think, I think it varies. Lots of you know, churches prefer one or the other. I think they're both really good, and they're both actually pretty close. If you actually put them side by side, they're pretty close. Uh, but we're going to be uh, in chapter one. We've got to get going, though, because this is going to be a while. Here we go. Uh, Mark chapter one, verse one says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I love how Mark starts off this gospel. He says, the beginning. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to point our attention back to Genesis chapter 1 and the beginning of, of creation, the beginning of all things. And, uh, and he's trying to say there is a beginning of a new creation coming. There is a beginning of something new that's taking place, and it is found and rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I like how the ESV translates that. If you look at the NIV or the NLT, it'll say the gospel about Jesus Christ, but I actually like of better because as we go through this book, you're going to realize that Jesus has a gospel to share in and of himself. He has a good news to share in and of himself. He's not, um, he's not, this isn't just a story about him. This isn't just good news about him. This is good news he's going to vocalize and share himself with the world um, and with those who, who come into contact with him throughout this book. And so this is, this is of him, and he has a better gospel. He has a better word than anyone that I could come up with or Mark could come up with or anyone else could come up with. It's of him. It's not just about him. Now, I also, he, he goes on and he says, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is key in the book. As you go through the book of Mark, you're going to uh, hear this phrase over and over and over again. We'll hear it next week. Uh, we'll hear it uh, as you continue to move through. You're going to hear this phrase, the Son of God. And what Mark is bent on, he's bent on helping us understand that Jesus is not just another prophet or healer or teacher or rabbi. He is the Son of God. He's the Son of God. And that claim is going to be stated all throughout this book, uh, and it starts this book, and it will also be a, a huge, huge declaration toward the end as well. In uh, verse 2, it says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And so... Um, there is, in case you're wondering what, like, what God is Jesus the son of, Mark's pretty clear there too. By quoting the prophet of Isaiah, he's pointing back to the Old Testament and Old Testament scripture and Old Testament prophecy, and he's drawing our attention to the fact that this is the God of Israel. Jesus is the son of the God of Israel, Yahweh, as he's known uh, throughout the Old Testament scriptures. And, uh, and he quotes this this. Um, he quotes this section of Isaiah to turn our attention away from Jesus just a little bit um, and put our attention on the one who's going to prepare the way for Jesus to come. And that is actually Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. Now, the word baptism or the word Baptist or whatever, uh, it, 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 it's the word in Greek. It's baptizo, and it means to plunge. So we can call John, John the plunger if we want, all right? It's completely okay to do that. And so uh, we're turning our attention to John um, and, and this idea um, here in verse 4. He says, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, we should, we should like, 
hone in on that, all right, for just a second. Underline that, highlight that, make a note of that. That's really, really important as we see how baptism is going to move throughout the early church and how it's going to move into further generations and how it should be upheld um, in our church or uh, in the Christian faith in general. Um, This is key. This is where it starts. It starts right here. John is baptizing. Uh, it says, and all the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him and were bapti- being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. He was a wild man, all right? Um, verse 7, it said, he preached, saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Spirit. Now, so, so John um, is, is in the wilderness, and all of Judea and Jerusalem, it says, is coming to him, confessing their sins and being baptized by him. And you may be saying, like, this seems like a weird thing to do, but it's, it's not so weird if you understand the context and the history of Israel and what they were called into and what John is proclaiming. What is John proclaiming? He's proclaiming that, that the presence of God in Jesus Christ is coming into the world. So the presence of God is making its way and is invading our world um, in the flesh, and we got to get ready for that. We got to be prepared for that. We got to make preparations to be with God. It's a really, really powerful thing. But in order, in Jewish tradition, in order to prepare yourself to be with God, um, if you were going to go into the presence of God, they had ceremonial washings and cleansings that you had to do and that that had to take place in order to actually enter the presence of God. You couldn't walk into the presence of God unclean. Now, in in Jewish tradition, there are many things that made you unclean. I mean, if you had a sore on your body, like if you had an ingrown hair on your knee, um, you were unclean and you had to remove yourself from God's people and from God's presence because you weren't welcome there until you were clean. But the thing that, that, that John is talking about, the thing that he's proclaiming makes us unclean is not some skin irritation. It's not some food law. It's sin. And you're going to see this as you kind of go throughout. You're going to see that the thing that John is bent on, the thing that Jesus is most bent on, that separates us from God and keeps us from his presence, that we have to figure out a way to deal with, is sin. And so what is John doing? He's proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, the washing, the cleansing of those sins in order that they can be in the presence of God. Now, um, this also represents uh, a lot of Israel's history and Israel's story. If you remember from the book of Exodus, maybe uh, you, you grew up in church, maybe you didn't. If you didn't, there's a story in the book of Exodus where uh, the, the Hebrew people have been in slavery in Egypt for 400 years, and they leave Egypt. They've, they've turned, and they're headed away from Egypt, and they get to this place where the Red Sea is, and it's kind of like a crossroads. Like, there's no way around it. Um, and so God makes a way through it. He parts the waters and the, the Israelites and Moses, they go through the water on dry land and the Egyptians chase them into the waters and are buried there by the waters. The waters come in and they bury them there. And it's a really uh, symbolic thing. Think about this for just a second. They're leaving their old life behind in Egypt. Okay, they're turning away from this old way of life that they've known in Egypt. And they're now moving in another direction. And they're headed toward the wilderness. And they get to the Red Sea. And then God delivers them through water. And he buries the very thing that's holding them captive and holding them and oppressing them in the water. And then they make their way out the other side to be in the wilderness, in the presence of God with cloud and fire. And so what happens in baptism? 
And what does baptism represent? It represents us turning away from our old way of life and moving in a new direction, being delivered through water, our sin which has held us captive, and is mo- and like Jesus' most important thing to deal with is buried in the waters of baptism and we are raised into new life to walk with God and his spirit from that point forward. Do you see the, do you see the correlation? Between baptism, um, and what John's proclaiming, and, and what baptism is meant to represent for us today. And, and, and John um, is not the only one who talks about it. He's not the only one who, who speaks of it. It goes all throughout the New Testament. It's not just John. It's, it's all the writers of the New Testament. And so today, what I really want to do is I want to focus on what, is, what does the Bible say uh, what is the biblical understanding of baptism? And, and, and why is it significant? And why is it important? And why is it something we should do and should practice? And, and I want to deal with some of the, I think, bad interpretations on what baptism is because, because of the Protestant Reformation, um, there, there's a lot of bad interpretations about baptism. Because of ancient traditions and original sin thoughts and all those other kinds of things, there's bad interpretations and practices of baptism. I just want to get to the biblical understanding of baptism, okay? So we're going to spend the rest of our time kind of walking through this. And we're going to start with what Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So you see here, Jesus correlates discipleship with baptism. He's saying, you, you want to go make followers, go make like people who are going to follow my way, and, and the way in which you do that is you baptize them and teach them to obey. You teach them what I've taught you and teach them how to obey those things, but you, you baptize them in my name, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as a marker of discipleship, of being a disciple of Jesus. Now, Jesus says this in Mark 16, 16. He says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, there's a correlation here between Jesus talking about the fact that when you believe, your response to your belief is baptism, that you step into baptism as a way of saying, I believe this. And we know that like, that's an actual, like to, to actually move and act and do something on behalf of our belief is actually something that is important if we're going to call ourselves Christians, right? There are plenty of people who believed in Jesus. The demons believed in Jesus, but they didn't follow Jesus. They didn't put on his identity. They didn't claim to be like his disciples. They believed in him. So there's belief and baptism linked together. And then we get a story of a guy who I think believed in Jesus but was also kind of unwilling to follow him because of what was at stake. In John chapter 3, verse 3 through 6, Jesus is talking to a Pharisee named Nicodemus. He says, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? <laughs> Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Man, Nicodemus, very smart. Very smart. <laughs> I tell you the truth. No one, this is Jesus now. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Now, I know a lot of people think that what, what Jesus is talking about of here is being born of water, being a water birth, that like we all are born by our moms and our moms are, you know, give water birth, right? What, what happens when you give birth? Ladies, your water breaks, right? So that's a water birth. And so a lot of people believe that this is what Jesus is talking about. Um, and and that's, that's fine. If that wants to be your interpretation, I, I don't, but I think Jesus is talking about baptism. Uh, one, because we're all born of water birth. That's a given, okay? And if you're not born of water birth, let me meet you, please. Like, I want to, what happened, right? Like, I don't, 
Um, but so we're all born of water. And he's not talking about being born. He's talking about being born again. And so, and, and so I, I, think he's, I think he's talking about baptism. I also think he's talking about baptism because of what Paul says in Titus chapter 3. Verse 5 through 7, when he says, He saved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. It's not because of what we've done, but it's because of his mercy. And he saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal or and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. So here you see Paul use almost like very similar language, washing of rebirth, right? Born of water and, and, and being born again, washing of rebirth and renewal of the spirit. And in all of these instances, what we're talking about is we're talking about um, people um, like being, being baptized and then joined with the Spirit, right? That's what Jesus says. You might, you're not going to see the kingdom unless you're born of water and the Spirit. Here, you see the washing and renewal, uh, or washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 39, after Peter has just proclaimed the first gospel message to, the, to uh, the world, it says that these people heard this and they were cut to the heart, I mean, they believed, like, in their heart, like, man, like, there's something, there's something special about this message. And they asked Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins in the name of, or every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. And so here, there are people who believe in the gospel, and they ask, what what do we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, and this is for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So again, baptism and spirit linked together. Paul talks about his own conversion experience at the end of Acts in Acts chapter 22, He says, a man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. And then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one, to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard, and now what you are waiting for. What are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. So this idea of calling on the name of Jesus, at least in Paul's conversion story, the way he's instructed to call on the name of Jesus is through baptism to wash away his sins. Romans 6, 3 through 5, Paul writes this. He says, Or don't you know that all of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. And so Paul talks about baptism being something that we are buried in the death of Jesus and raised to life in um, the resurrection of Jesus. And we share with him in this, that we become united to Christ in this act of baptism, that we are united to Christ by sharing in his death and resurrection. Galatians 3 Paul says this, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have closed yourselves with Christ. He's saying that, oh, you, you're all, all sons and, and daughters because you've been baptized and clothed yourselves with Christ. So now when Christ looks at you, he sees a son and daughter of God because you've put on Christ in your baptism. Then he goes on, Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, he says, In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature. So you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature. Circumcision in the Jewish tradition was cutting off part of the foreskin of a particular male part of the body. 
and uh, it, was, it was deemed to set you apart as holy and righteous with God and before God uh, as a part of his chosen people. And so it was, a, it was a large place where people found their identity. And he says, but you have not been circumcised or with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised you from the dead. So he's saying the way you're set apart, your circumcision looks like being baptized and being made holy through the act of baptism and being raised in newness of life. 1 Peter 3, uh, 21 through 22 um, Peter's talking about Noah and the ark, and, and he refers to it this way. He says, and the water, and this water, symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus. I would, if I had my Bible, I'd circle that. I'd underline that. By the resurrection of Jesus, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of uh, or is at, the, at God's right hand with angels, authorities, powers, and submission to him. So this is what the Bible teaches about baptism. And um, I'm going to get to why I think that it, it, um, it sounds a lot different than what we often say or how we often define baptism, how we often talk about baptism. But I first want to say, I don't, I, you, you guys probably have various questions. You're probably thinking various things. You're probably wondering like really like all kinds of stuff right now. And uh, I, I want you to know, okay, uh, I don't think that water saves anybody, okay? I don't think that water in and of itself is gonna save anybody. Don't put your faith in water, okay? Don't put your hope in water. However, I do think you should put your hope in the things that the water represents. And according to what Peter says, the water represents and baptism represents the death burial and resurrection of Jesus as sufficient atonement for our sins. And from what I can see from Genesis all the way through the New Testament, this idea of being delivered through water and being baptized is the most biblical way to respond to the gospel when you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior and his death, burial, and resurrection have and have been given and done for you. The most biblical way to respond to that is baptism. Now, I can, I can say with a lot of confidence, I'm pretty sure if you were a first century person and you were looking to become a follower of Jesus and you asked another first century Christian, what does it look like to be a follower of Jesus? They would not have left out baptism. Baptism. And the fear that I have is that we do. The fear that I have is that we don't talk about baptism in correlation to people's response to belief and hope in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, a lot of people that I've had conversations with, and don't let this rub you the wrong way if you are part of this particular denomination, but my Baptist friends in the room, okay? Okay. Um, I love you. You know that you're, you're great people, okay? I, I love you deeply, my Baptist friends. However, um, I, hear, I hear a lot when I talk to my Baptist friends about baptism. What I hear is, well, what about Romans 10.9, Derek? What about Romans 10.9? Where Paul says, you know, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. What about that? And I say, well, yeah, that's, that's great. How does that have to be separated from baptism? Can't baptism be a, a true like, act of belief in your heart and declaration, confession, like with your mouth and with your life? Can't it? Why do we have to separate the two? Why are we going to elevate that over baptism that's commanded? Why would we do that? Right? And then here's the other thing, is that I, I hear a lot of people talk about Romans 10, 9 in correlation with the sinner's prayer. Do you guys know the sinner's prayer? And i got to be honest with you. The only problem I have with the sinner's prayer is it's not in the Bible. Romans 10, 9 is not the sinner's prayer. Right? And I don't see a sinner's prayer in the Bible. The only sinner's prayer that I see in the Bible is when somebody walks up to Jesus and says, 
Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he has on the cross. He died for your sins to give you mercy and grace. And the most biblical way to respond to that and accept that gift of mercy and grace is to be baptized. David Platt says this about the sinner's prayer. I don't know if you guys know who David Platt is. He pastors a church in Washington, D.C. But he says this. He says, should it not concern us that there is no such thing or no such suspicious prayer in the New Testament? Should it not concern us that the Bible never uses phrases, invite Jesus into your heart or invite Jesus into your life? It is not the gospel we see being preached. It's a modern evangelism built on sinking sand and it runs the risk of disillusioning millions of souls. It is a very dangerous thing to lead people to think that they are Christian when they haven't biblically responded to the gospel. That's pretty strong words, but I'm pretty sure he's right. It is a very dangerous thing to call people to follow Jesus in a way that Jesus did not call them to follow him. Now, I know many people, um, and maybe you along with them, will believe that praying a prayer is all that is needed in order to be given salvation and eternal life in heaven. And I'll let Jesus be the determining factor on that. I'm not him, and I'm, I'm good with it if he's good with it, right? Um, but what I can tell you is that Jesus does say that becoming a disciple, becoming a follower of Jesus in Matthew 28 involves baptism. Involves baptism. And then obeying. Which is another thing I hear a lot is that, oh, well, baptism is just, it's just an act of obedience to do what God has called us to do. Okay? But Jesus talks about being baptized, and I do think that, yes, there's an obedience that we have to uh, uh, adhere to there, but he doesn't talk about it uh, in, a, in response to being a Christian. He talks about it as the first thing you do when you want to be a Christian. Because when you want to be a disciple, be baptized and then obey. He's not saying like, hey, clean yourself up, obey, and then go get baptized. It won't work, by the way. So, so I... I we can, we can say, well, it's about obedience. Well, maybe that's, I don't think it's just about obedience. Maybe it's part of it, but it's not just that. And, and here's, my, here's my last and final thing about like, where I really find a little bit of angst with the sinner's prayer. You guys know if you've been coming to our church for any period of time at all, you know we don't do this, right? Like I don't, at the end of a message, you know, ask people to repeat a prayer after me if they want to invite Jesus into their heart or, or something like that. And that's, that's all good intentioned, okay? And, and if you've been taught that that's okay, I, I don't think anybody's trying to lead you astray. That's all has great intention and great um, heart behind it. But I have, a, I have a deep concern if someone's willing to pray a prayer in secret and not stand up and move in baptism to be obedient to what the Bible actually says, I have deep concern on how legitimate that faith really is if someone's willing to pray a prayer but not actually do what the Bible says to do when, you're, when you believe. And so I, I, maybe, maybe pray the prayer, but make sure you also say, hey, if we pray this prayer, like it's time to be baptized. <laughs> and I think we leave that out a lot. We leave that out a lot. And we shouldn't. Because that's not the way it's laid out in the Bible. There's also some of you who come from different traditions, different backgrounds, ancient traditions that elevate um, that elevate baptism really highly, um, and 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 have like this understanding of original sin and dealing with original sin, and we got to deal with original sin as soon as possible. So like when three days out of the womb, let's sprinkle that baby, right? And and I and I understand that that's a good intention, and that has a high elevation of baptism and its correlation to salvation, and it's tied to salvation, but it's just not biblical. It's not it's not what we see in the scriptures. Baptism is an act and a decision made by a repentant heart that wants to turn away from one way of life to live a new life with Christ. That's what we see in the scriptures. An infant can't make that decision. And we shouldn't make that decision for them. They, they hopefully, if we raise them well, will be able to understand when they are in need of salvation 
and they will call on the Lord and hopefully be baptized. Right? That's the hope. And so, again, I don't think it's bad, but I don't think it's biblical. And baptism is an act of repentance, an act of turning away from your sin, it's being having your sins washed and buried in a watery grave and being raised into a born-again life that's marked and sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's what we see in Scripture. And let me say, the water is not what saves you. It's what the water represents. It's the death and resurrection of Jesus that we put our hope in. And baptism is a declaration that our hope is in that death and resurrection. And so if we're baptized, we should know where we stand. And biblically speaking, there is no better way to make that declaration. Therefore, I just say if you haven't been baptized, why not today? Why not today? If you believe, if you profess faith in Jesus, that he's your Lord and Savior, why not today? Why not be baptized today? We legitimately have everything you need. We have clothes. We have towels. We have water that I set up last night at like 10 p.m. and put a heater in it so that it would be warm and all of those kinds of things. So you don't have to even be baptized in dirty cold water like the Israelites did. <laughs> it's all ready to go. There's a story in Acts chapter 8 about how I think that this kind of works because a lot of people are like, oh, well, no, I'm not I'm not ready. It's too spontaneous for me. Well, look at this story. Acts chapter 8, verse 35 through 38 says, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now, I love this scripture because I think it's actually uh, not just how do we respond to the gospel, but it's also how do we share the gospel. And one of the things that's clear here is it says that, that, that he shared the gospel. Philip shared the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch. And it doesn't say he shared the gospel and then talked to him about baptism. It says he shared the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And, and when they saw water, the eunuch was like, there's water. Can I be, what, what keeps me from being baptized right now? Meaning that in sharing the gospel, baptism was a part of that. <laughs> he didn't leave that part out. Or else, why would this Ethiopian, who has no understanding of this tradition, no understanding of this ritual, no understanding of this, this symbolic act, why would he just all of a sudden go, Water. Right? So not only does the Ethiopian eunuch respond and like, oh, here it is. Here's my chance. Let me do it now. Why wait? I believe. It also shows that like when you talk or share the gospel with someone, don't leave out baptism. Don't leave that out. You have friends at work. You have you have like people in your family, you have neighbors that you're, you're trying to in, encourage and inspire and lead to the Lord, please don't leave out baptism. Please don't leave out baptism. All right? Now, so therefore, if you believe, right, and you haven't been baptized, I encourage you right here, right now, today, we have it all. We got water, we got clothes, we got towels, we got it all. So I ask you the same question the Ethiopian eunuch asked of Philip, what keeps you? from being baptized? The answer is nothing except your own free will, <laughs> if you so choose. So let me finish this by saying, um, if you have a different understanding or interpretation or something other than what I laid out today, okay, no problem. I, I have no problem with that. I understand that. I understand many of you um, probably have been taught different things about this and, and those kinds of things. Um, our church has no problem with that. Our elders have no problem with that. Our staff has no problem. In fact, our elders and staff, probably most of them would not take as strong of a stance on baptism as I do. <laughs> but it doesn't, it, uh, yeah, there's one of them, yeah. He's <laughs> like, you better believe it, Jack. Um, 
So, but, but, but here's the thing is like we don't let things like this divide us. We don't let things like this divide us. I just, I'm just trying to do a good job of teaching the Bible and teaching it truthfully. And, um, and I, too often I hear people say, well, baptism is just an outward sign of an inward change. It's not true. It's an outward sign of an inward awareness that you're a sinner and you're in need of salvation from Jesus Christ. And it's never defined as an outward display of an inward change in the scriptures. It's defined as an act of discipleship. It's defined as a response to the gospel. It's defined as uh, where we find our identity in Christ as sons and daughters of the Most High. It is defined as, as something that gives us eternal security. It's defined as the washing away of sins, of rebirth, of being born again. That's what it's defined as in the scriptures. And I just don't want it to be hijacked and defined some, some other way just because it's more culturally convenient, right? And if that makes me a less effective evangelist, I'm okay with that because I think it makes me a better evangelist. So here's the deal is that um, if you have a different interpretation, I, I would encourage you, um, you're a Christian more than likely. Um, you... You have the Holy Spirit, if you are a Christian, which is great. Wrestle with him. <laughs> I mean, you can come wrestle with me if you want. We can chat this out over Chick-fil-A, uh, you know, as long as you want. It's just, I don't think it's going to do a whole lot of good for you. I would wrestle with the Holy Spirit because it's a far better place to wrestle than with me. <laughs> and, um, and I think he'll speak to you, and I think he'll convict your heart, um, whatever ultimately needs to be done there, you know, if there is something there. Um, but also know anything that I say or anything that I bring to the table from up here is done out of love. I, like, I think a lot of times, like, like there, there's not enough benefit of the doubt given a lot of times when someone like me stands up and gives a talk like this, that like, we do this because we love you. <laughs> and we do this because out of love, we are trying to be faithful to the scriptures and teach you the word of God <laughs> as best as we can because we don't want to lead you astray. And so I don't want to lead you astray. I don't, I'm not saying anyone else in your life has ever tried to lead you astray if they told you something different than this. Everything we say and do is out of love. And if it isn't, then we have nothing. We have nothing, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 13. So um, if you have different thoughts, different opinions, it's okay. I'll still love you, and you're still welcome here. Please don't break fellowship you know, all of that kind of stuff, uh, because there's going to be a lot of people in heaven that think differently than we do. We're going to worship with them one day. Might as well worship with them now. You know what I mean? <laughs> As a, we, can, we, can often, we can often, you know, learn a lot more, grow a lot more by being committed to being unified and together, knowing that, you know what, I don't know everything, but I know Jesus loves me and I know Jesus saves me, and I can just unite with other people who believe that. Right? Amen? Amen? All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much for your love and your grace. Um, thank you for your mercy. God, I thank you for the... I thank you for the call to be baptized. And I thank you for the act of baptism. Um, and its deep, symbolic nature in our faith. God, I, I pray that not only will we be obedient to it, but that we will let it be something that marks our life, where we no longer doubt if we have received your grace or have received your mercy. God, as we have been baptized, we have shared in your death and in your resurrection where grace and mercy abound and where we are forgiven. And so God, may we 
May we know that and put our hope in that. God, I pray for um, those in the room right now who are wrestling. I pray that you would just speak to them, be with them, counsel them, be their advocate. God, for those in the room who are feeling a nudge to, to move and and to be baptized because they haven't and they feel like, wow, like I probably should be. God, I just, I thank you for that in their heart. And I just want to um, just ask you, you continue to encourage them in that direction. Lead them in that way, whether today or tomorrow or a week from now or a year from now. God, lead them um, in this way that they might respond to your gospel appropriately and biblically. God, we love you. Thank you and praise you so much for Jesus Christ. And he is the hope we have and the hope we hold on to. In Jesus' name, amen.